come on in. Hey, Steven. How you doing? Hey, Nicole. Hey, let's all stand together, please. Let's stand as I read from God's word. These last few weeks, Pastor Che has been preaching about God's love. And it's something that, Lord willing, we, we never get overly familiar with, right? That we never grow tired of hearing of God's love. So let me read from 1 John. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love to God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Lord, this is love, not that we loved you first, but you reached out to us. Lord, you sought us, you pursued us, you sent your Son for us. So Lord, our only response is gratitude, our only proper response is to praise you and to thank you. So let's do that this morning as we sing.
I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You've been so, so kind to me. Before I took a breath, you breathe your life in me. You've been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Still I'm found these are 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God All your love, your love Verse 2, when I was your foe, when I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You've been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You've been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fight still. I'm found leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you.
put up verse 2 again, please? As we were singing this, I felt like God was reminding us that when you are at your lowest point, when you are at the point of despair, is that point where God meets us. So if you are at a point where you feel like you have nowhere else to turn, that you feel no worth, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would remind you that He is the one who is worthy, that He is the one that lifts you up. So let's sing verse 2. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You've been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. Yes. You've been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Lord, your love for us is astounding. Lord, it should overwhelm us. Lord, we, we are amazed. Lord, this is love, not that we first loved you, but that you first loved us and sent Jesus for us. Lord, we come covered by the blood of the cross. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Please have a seat. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Che. I'm the Ian Pastor here at the Cleveland KCPC Church. I hope and pray wherever you are, Jeju Island, Severance Hospital in Seoul, South Korea, Lake Oswego, Oregon, Waco, Texas, State College, Pennsylvania, Bexley, Ohio, Ashland, Ohio, Garfield Heights, Garfield Heights Ohio, in Paris with Lupin and Cleveland. They're all safe and growing in love for God and each other in these difficult and historic times. I have a lot of announcements today, so please bear with me. We'll continue to have live streaming services on Zoom. Uh, you can get on our website. You can also continue to give online on our website as well. Eventually, we're going to have offering, physical offering plate as well for those who are not online. Um, also, we'll, um, also, if you can congratulate um, Lydia and Joe Kang. Okay, I think they're watching right now. Um, the birth of their uh, beautiful son, Levi, was born actually. Her water broke around 2 o'clock in the morning last week, last Sunday, and they had Levi, 7 pounds, um, uh, last, I believe, su Sunday afternoon. I heard the labor was only 20 minutes. Incredible. The next one's just going to pop out, okay? But uh, please continue to pray for them, uh, for Joe and Lydia. Um, also, um, I don't know where Harry is. Uh, the youth group needs part-time and full-time Bible study teachers. If you're interested, please speak with Harry Rue, if you can raise your hands. Uh, there, there are some standards. First of all, you have to love God, okay, in Christ. And second, you have to love youth group, okay? You have to love youth kids, okay? So if you're a youth hater, don't be, a, okay, a youth group teacher. But they need help. They need a lot of help uh, if you can contact um, be, with Harry Rue. Also, this is very important. For 2022 to 2024, we have a term officers group for deacons. Philip Kim, an elder. Philip Kim. Uh, for Elder, Dr. Philip Kim for Elder, Julie Saul, Amanda Kim, and Harry Lee are nominated for deacons. Uh, there's a special congregational meeting to vote for final approval of all candidates. It will be held in the main sanctuary upstairs on Sunday, September 12th at 12.15 following KM worship service. All candidates 
and members are requested to attend. We'll have this announcement next week as well. So Philip Kim for an elder. Okay, Julie saw Amanda Kim and Harry Lee nominated for deacons. And this is going to be voting on September 12th, right after KM service at 1215 in the sanctuary. Also, just excited to announce that we have a Labor Day retreat lock-in this, uh, this coming Friday. Okay, and our theme would be Ignite. Um, the cost of the retreat is only $20 per person. And there's food as well. And so regardless of life stage, okay? And so it includes all meals and activities. And so uh, if you want more information, get online, okay? But um, it's going to start this Friday. So if you're interested, I believe the deadline is tonight, 1259. So please, if you can sign up for, for this lock-in retreat, praise night, okay? Also, um, uh, our, we have our Wednesday night Bible studies for the college students. Okay, we have a lot of young adult, I mean, college leaders, if I can meet with you afterwards as well. But it's in person, um, and so they'll be meeting at the STJ, multi-purpose room, every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Especially if you're a freshman, we really encourage you to come to that. You can speak to any, any of our leaders, Chris, Steve, there's so many, of us, so many of them. If you have any questions, please speak to them as well. Also, uh, this is first for drivers. We really need drivers from Agape especially from young adults. They're, they're taking the major uh, burden and load. But we really need drivers. We have a lot of, especially college students, that need a ride, okay? And we don't want to Uber them, you know, or uh, whatever. But we really need drivers, okay? And so we're going to have a link for you guys on the website and email as well. And also, if you need a ride, please contact Jody um, specifically. Uh, it's online as well. So if you need a ride, please... Um, you know, if you're going to sign up, please do it as early as possible so Jody and the rest of the team can really organize. Also, also if you're interested in being baptized or your child to be baptized, um, uh, Pastor Joshua Kim will come here and give a baptismal ceremony. If you're interested, please contact Elder Kate Lee. Also, uh, I got, um, all uh, preschool kids, they have a virtual Sunday school for children 915 on Zoom. If you have any questions, you can please ask Ashley as well. Also, please continue to pray for the crisis in Afghanistan, uh, I was speaking with Eloy. I met with Eloy Gonzalez, who's also a retreat speaker as well. He works for Building Hope in the City. 30 Afghan refugees have already come into Cleveland, and many more are expected to come. And so, as you know, we have a, a relationship with Building Hope in the City. So we're, they're really going to need our help. Um, they did a lot of um, lawyer stuff this past week. But uh, they're, they're coming to, uh, to Cleveland Please continue to pray for the crisis in Afghanistan. Please continue to pray for the earthquake uh, devastation in Haiti and also this hurricane that's coming through New Orleans today. Please continue to be in your prayers. I was very encouraged. I heard that Preston and Christian um, took to RTA on early Saturday morning. What, what college students do that? Okay, and they went all the way to RTA and dropped off at the station, stopped at the very spot, not very spot, very close to where Tamir Rice was unjustly killed, and then, then they walked in all the way, Building Hope in the City. They were impacted by Katie Ann and Thomas that spoke a few weeks ago of Building Hope in the City. And so if you want to get involved with Building Hope in the City, please let any of our young adult leaders know, and uh, we can have you take classes, and then you'll be forever linked to Building Hope in the City. Also, like I said, mentioned before, if I can meet with all uh, college uh, leaders after the service as well. Please continue to pray for all of our first responders, medical professionals, teachers, parents, and students as well during this difficult time. Thank you for your patience. If you could all stand up and join us, join together in confessing our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born in the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Knowing that we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory, let us confess our sins to God together at this time in silence.
Friends, believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. In Him we're forgiven. Amen. sit down at this time. I'm going to have Kanu come up and pray for us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day and for allowing all of us to share in our time and resources to come together and worship you. During this time, may we take in your word to renew our mind and further prove your good and perfect will. And as we remember to remain steadfast within prayer that we may learn to be strong in our faith, let us reflect on the Lord's prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth that is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Thank you Gano. Just, I, I forgot two more announcements. Uh, so starting next week, we're gonna have an uh, overflow room because um, there's a room upstairs. It's going to be live streaming. It can hold about 30 people because I think we're pretty much at capacity. And also, starting in September, the families with kids, like my kids, are going to be allowed to come. And so we have some space issues. So starting next week, uh, we're going to have um, a, 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 um, a live streaming room upstairs that can hold about 30 people as well as the families are able to come back, Okay. We'll continue the series on love. We can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices for the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, there will cease. But where there are tongues, there will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. But now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God. Just before I start, just, just it's great to see so many people here. Uh, just going to do a special shout out. It's great to see Elise back all the way from Kentucky, okay? And so it's great to have Elise. For, for those who don't know, especially college students, uh, she did so much, her and Monica, uh, for four years at Without, she wasn't paid staff or anything. <laughs> She's a student. She did so much at the Case Campus, and God really used her and Monica and so many else to really build up the ministry. So remember uh, the fruit of her labor and many others before you guys. Also, it's good to see a good a, a friend. I first met her in um, January 2013, okay? And she, she sat, she's at that school up north, okay? That's what I'm going to say, okay? Go blue. Anyway, but uh, Unji, and she's back. She, she was here way back when. Okay, and so she's, uh, she's getting her residency, and she met our beloved, uh, one of our beloved leaders, Jenna Lee, right, small world, and, and Ann Arbor, okay, and so just good to see her as well. All right, let me start now, okay, so uh, I'm going to tell you two true stories that happened, okay, recently, okay, one, what love is, a perfect description of what love is, remember last week I talked about love is patient, love is kind, and then I'm going to share a story about what love is not, okay, which starting today, I'm going to tell you what 
the opposite of love is, okay? This is a true story. Uh, about a month ago or something,、uh, Lydia had her baby shower. Immediately afterwards, my, my wife and the two, my two kids went to Sarah and Kai's house. And then they have a beautiful, patient, loving daughter named Jinju. And she was playing with my four year old son. But my four year old son had to go to the bathroom. You know what she did? What four year old does this? She said to Josiah, my son, I'll wait for you outside the door. Okay? Well, who does that? I won't do that for you. And so he goes in the ba- bathroom, and only God knows what kind of abomination and desolation that was dispensed there. And she waited patiently, kindly, okay, until he came out. Hopefully, he washed his hands, okay, and they went downstairs to the basement to play. That is a perfect description of love. Let me show you a perfect description of what love is not, okay? I was driving my daughter, okay, from school the other day. It takes 32 minutes, 31 minutes from her school to my house. And I, I just wanted to encourage my daughter, okay, my four year old daughter. I said, and she, had a, she said something incredible. Was, I said, Chloe, you have a memory of an elephant.、And、you know what her response is? She said, Daddy, you have the body of an elephant. <laughs> and I kid you not, for 31 minutes, she kept on perseverating. I have the body of an ele- elephant. She kept on, not only that, she said, You know, Daddy, did you know an elephant is bigger than a hippo? Did you know, Daddy, that an elephant is bigger than, a, bigger than、um, a, 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 a rhino? And she kept on going, perseverating over and over and over again. And you know, I have this, I have this complex. My beautiful niece,、uh, Priscilla, and her older sister, when, when they were younger, like around Chloe and Josiah's age, okay, you know, we wrestled or whatever, and I would do push ups, and they would be on top of me. And, I, and after about 400 times, I get tired, right? But they would, they would like punch my stomach. I kid you not. And they would say, trampoline, trampoline, trampoline. So I have this complex. That's a perfect description of what love is not. But I, I, they're my family, so I love them unconditionally. Well, we're continuing this series on love. And remember what I said the last few weeks. You know, it doesn't matter how, how, what great things you do, how many miracles you do, how, many, how much talent you have. If you don't have love, you count for nothing. You're nothing. If you win at love, you will not fail at life. If you fail at love, you will fail at life. But don't you think this culture disagrees with that a lot of times? This culture a lot of times teaches that power is more important. Fame is more important than love. Now, this is old school. Maybe Phil knows this. I don't know anybody else my age. Maybe uh, uh, Sam knows this. But there's a, do you guys know an incredible singer? Her name is Tina Turner. You guys ever heard of Tina Turner? Remember, what's love got to do, got to do with it? Do you remember? Okay. What's love but a secondhand emotion? Right? Do you remember, remember that? Okay, and then she says, What's love got to do, got to do with it? And she says, Well, who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? And she's kind of like, That's his love because she, she herself was、uh, broken, right? You know, but biblically, love is the most important thing in the world. And like, you know, some of you guys think you are the master of love. You think you wrote the book on love, okay? And what did I say last week? I don't care if you're Tupac, Biggie, Lamar, Chay Z, Keith or Shelly, or Shakespeare, or Longfellow, or Young Stephen or Justin. These are teachings from the most revered, most cherished, most. This is the greatest literature on love ever written, okay? And like I mentioned before, this wasn't written for a wedding, a beautiful wedding I attended last week, okay? When the church in Corinth heard this, they didn't have fuzzy feelings. But contraire, okay? That's French for Korean. I mean, that's, I mean, that's contrary in French. But anyway, these were, this is a deliberately, deliberate slap in the face. Paul was rebuking them for their lack of love. Because the church in Corinth was so prideful. They thought they were all that. They did all these great things for God. They had no love. They were messed up. And there's three basic problems that Paul mentions throughout the letter that they struggle with. Number one, it says they're still worldly in chapter three. It means these are fighting words. It says that you are, you are against God and his kingdom. Okay? Number two, because he says, For since there is envy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? And then he says, Your boasting is not good. You know, the word boast is mentioned 37 times in the New Testament. And Corinth is like ground zero for boasting. And in fact, the word boasting in the book of Corinth is used more times than all of the New Testament combined, put together. In fact, the word, specific word for boast in Corinth is the book, is the name. Per- 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 Per pepperoni, not pepperoni, okay? Per pepperoni, okay? And it's, no, it's used nowhere else in the New Testament. You know what it means? It means to talk conceitedly and repeatedly over and over how great you are. So there's a huge amount of envy. 
there's a huge amount of boast in this Corinthian church. You know, bragging is like the other side of envy. Envy is wanting what someone else has. Bragging is trying to make other people jealous of what you have, right? Envy puts other people, you know, puts other people down, while bragging puts yourself up, okay? And so the Corinthians were spiritual show-offs. C.S. Lewis said he, he called bragging the utmo- utmost evil. It's the epitome of pride, the root of all sins. Our political candidates, our political people in office, what do they do when they run off for office? What do they do? They brag. Aren't you encouraged that the leaders of our country, they got that position because they brag about themselves, okay? You know, one of my, I tell stories, I, tell you this, I told you this a lot. I tell a story almost every night to my six-year-old daughter. And one of the favorite stories, she loves this cartoon called Gigantosaurus, okay? It's a story about this huge T-Rex. And there's a, a character in that uh, cartoon. You can watch it on Disney Junior for those who are interested, Phil. Okay? There's a character in there called Rocky. And Rocky is constantly bragging about himself. I kid you not, I have told over 100 stories about Rocky. Chloe cannot stand Rocky. And so what kind of story she wants me to tell is some, some, someone like me or you beating up Rocky, beating him in something. Okay? Okay? Because she can't stand Rocky because she keeps on saying, Daddy, why does he keep bragging about himself? Okay, so that's the second problem here. And the third problem, and this is a very rare word, okay? It says their knowledge puffs them up, and you are puffed up. He says knowledge puffs up while love builds up. You know, puffed up is a really colorful term in the Greek literature. It's a picture, is, think of a huge balloon, and you can easily pop it. It looks nice, the balloon looks really nice, but you can easily pop it. I would love that to happen to my stomach as well. But see, envy is something you do. Boasting is something you do. But puffed up is something you are. Okay? And and Paul says you struggle with these things. These are major issues in your life. You envy. You boast. You're puffed up. So they're just basking in them. Okay? You know, I, I mentioned last week that love is patient, love is kind. And now today, he puts the hammer down of what love is not. And I'm going to specifically uh, uh, focus on envy. Okay, he says, love does not envy. Okay? And, and so he's saying that the opposite of love is envy. I don't know if this is old school again. In my, I was in China for, in mission, for missions in 1993 to 1995, before many of you guys were born. Okay? And I remember, do you guys know what a VHS is? VHS test? Okay, that's old school. You guys know what horses are? Anyway, but anyway, this is uh, back in the 1990s. And so, you know, we're, we had no entertainment back in the early 90s. There wasn't even a St. Arbucks in, where I was in China at, back then. And so people would send us uh, VHS recordings of famous shows, like there's a show called Seinfeld. You ever heard of Seinfeld? I mean, there's some inappropriate things, like in every episode, but besides that, it was a pretty funny show. And so there's a character in there named George Constanza. You guys remember that? Okay? He's sort of a, how can I say this nicely? Sort of a loser. Okay? And there's a one episode, I still remember this. He, he realized how much of a loser he was one day. And he says, my life is nothing. I am nothing. I'm getting everything wrong in life. My instinct is wrong. So you know what? He has this new life strategy. He says, I'm going to do everything opposite. He does everything opposite his instinct, his heart does generally. And you know what happens? Beautiful women are attracted to him. Okay? His life is great because he does everything opposite of what his heart tells him to do. Listen, Paul's not being subtle here. Paul is saying, you are like the George Constanza of churches. Okay, he doesn't actually say that. Okay? You are the opposite of what love is supposed to be. Okay? You're not love. You're the opposite of love. Okay? And, and Paul, remember, he's telling this in love because he doesn't want them to wallow, uh, you know, have them a life of not love. He loves them, so he challenges them and rebukes them. He wants them to build a community. He wants them to, be, to live the kind of life that God has called each one of us to live as well. Okay? And so he, what Jesus is picture says, do the opposite of this culture. So for the rest of this talk, I just want to focus on that first great knot. Love does not envy. Love does not envy. You know, Shakespeare called envy, jealousy, the green sickness. I want us to turn to James 3, verse 14 and 16. The A team can put it up. A V team, not A team, okay? If you harbor bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritually, demonic. 
For where you have envy and selfish ambition exists, there you find disorder in every evil thing. Oh my goodness, this is, envy is not a little thing. He actually calls it demonic. You know, the root word for um, envy is the Greek word zelu. It's where we get the word uh, um, zealous. It means all-consuming. It means that envy can literally consume you. And it's all over the Bible, right? Envy was the first sin in the Bible. The first murder in the Bible. Cain and Abel, Joseph and his brother, Jacob and Esau, throughout the Bible. And did you notice, not only in the Bible, did you notice all good dramas are full of envy? Okay? Isn't Korean drama, a lot of that rooted in envy, isn't it? Wasn't there a movie that won uh, Academy Award, Parasite? Isn't that full of envy? I'm not going to mention, but one of you guys told me what happened at the very end, okay? I never watched it, okay? Okay? And now I'm envious that I know. Anyway, but you see, but life is full of envy. You know, for the past five or six years, my wife and I have been watching a Netflix show called The Crown. Okay, ever seen The Crown? And it's this sort of pseudo -bio you know, biographical thing on you know, Queen Elizabeth and whatever, whatever. And there's great acting. Great acting. Okay? And they all have great accents, like Nicole. Okay? It's just a beautiful... And it's just this one scene where Charles is so jealous of Diana because Diana's getting all this attention. Okay? And, and mess, uh, there's many other issues, like being in love with someone else, but they have all these issues, a lot of it because of jealousy. You know, envy is not just, it's not just a little sin. Envy is actually the opposite of love. Love and envy is mutually exclusive. You know, a person who feels love, they're enhanced by the well-being of others. A person of envy feels diminished by the well-being of others. You know, when I love somebody, I constantly want to build them up. When I envy someone, okay, I want them to constantly go down, right? And remember, envy has actually two forms. One is, I want what they have. But there's a worse form, more insidious form. Not only that, I wish they don't have what they have. And it's the second one that's the most deepest, most evil and destructive level. Not only do I want what they have, I compare myself to them, and actually I want their life to be torn down. Remember, envy calls the first murder. I don't know if you guys remember this great story of Solomon and his wisdom. The first Kings chapter 3, I believe. You remember, there are two prostitutes. They both had babies. And one of the prostitutes accidentally kills the infant son. Uh, by sleeping on him. And, so, and then she grabs the other baby from the mother, the real mother, and said, they'll go before the king, and they both fight who's the real mother. You remember what Solomon says? Okay, why don't, we, why don't we cut the baby in half? And the real mother says, no, 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 no. No, you can give it to that mother. And the fake mother says, oh, yeah, I think that's a great idea. That's a great idea. You see, not only did she want what she had, she actually wanted the mother, the real mother, to not have what she had. And obviously, because of that test, Solomon knew who the real mother was, okay? How many of you here wrestle with envy? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Be honest. Okay, if you don't raise your hands, uh, how many of you guys have lied, okay? Raise your hands right now. Can you not be so, okay, how many of you guys have never envied before? Okay? Your okay, raise your hands if you struggle with envy. Shh. Raise it up. Okay, those who have not raised your hands, okay, either you're not sure, okay, not confident, you're lying, okay? That's what I thought. Everybody struggles with envy. You know, one of the great things, and I'm being sarcastic here, one of the great things of living in such a sophisticated city like Cleveland is not only are we surrounded by two nuclear war plants, nuclear, nuclear reactor plants, I thank God for the vast education and technological and vocational opportunities that we have. We in Cleveland, because we're so sophisticated and educated, we have basically defeated envy. We never compare ourselves with other people. Never. Not here, because we live in Cleveland, the land. And we never struggle with appearance or image or, you know, or being smarter and more successful than other people or making more money. People live here with modest spirits, right? And content, quiet hearts. Thank God we're not like New York City or L.A. or the Silicon Valley. I mean, we have the Cuyahoga Valley, amen? Okay? And we have a, and we have a nice forest, okay? Right? We have defeated envy in this great city of ours, just demonstrated by this room here. You know, People who study envy, you know, they say that we usually don't envy people who are like extremely famous, who are not part of our life. We usually envy people who are very much close to our life, our, our proximity, right? And that's been true of me as well. I, I'm going to list just for your own amusement, 
it lists of some of the people, some of the kind of people I have envied over the years. Okay? I'm going to tell you so many people I've envied over the years. People who are more athletic than me, basically everyone. People who are smarter than me. Guys who are better, better looking than me, everyone. Weightlifters, for obvious reasons. Football players, basketball players, baseball players. Better musicians. People who are more extroverted than me. People who are better pastors. People who are better speakers. Better writers. Better leaders.、Uh, people who have parents of perfect families, with perfect kids, and perfect pets. People who are not allergic to cats like I am. Actually, I'm, I'm happy I'm allergic to cats, okay? People who go on perfect vacations and move from success to success. People who are great at confrontation. People who never pout. Who use the silent treatment when they're mad. They just get more articulate. Movers and shakers of perfect hair or more hair, perfect resumes, perfect clothes, even, okay? People who never break a sweat, people who have it all together. If you're here today and you don't have a problem with envy, I envy you too, okay? okay? And so, you know, I, you, know, I, you know, a lot of times, pastors, myself, I pretend like I don't envy. I pretend like really, you know, I'm, I'm above envy. And so I boast in a way to disguise it because I'm a pastor. It's called a humble brag, right? I try to do it in a, hum, in a very clever way. It makes it seem like I'm not bragging, but I'm actually bragging. Have you noticed a lot of times when we're judgmental towards someone, usually underneath that judgmentalism is envy, okay? I judge them to make myself feel better about myself, right? Because deep inside, I envy them, okay? So generally, when you're judgmental towards someone, it's usually because there's some sort of envy in there. And that's why envy is one of the hardest battles, because there's always someone better. Right? There's always someone better. And we all face temptation and envy. I do. I struggle with envy. Because envy is the opposite of love in a way that other sins are not. You know, greed is a sin. I might be greedy. I want as much money or more money than you have. But, it, it, but if I envy you, it's not just I want more money than you. I want you to have less money, period. I want you to be, I want you to be diminished. I want something bad to happen to you. Right? That's so wicked about envy. Okay, how many of you guys have you ever seen a perfect life, a perfect person? And you criticize him or her for the most ridiculous things. You know, like a month ago, after we went to Texas State Brazil, I envied Joe Kang's car. Okay, it, outside I'm like, wow, that's a great car. It can park itself. Inside I'm like, wow, Joe, you, don't, you can't even park by yourself, can you? Okay, okay now I walk to my Toyota Corolla. Okay, okay. And so this is the wrong set of competitiveness. Listen, we're on a series on love, right? No kidding. But my thought is, as a pastor, it is my goal to make this church the most loving church in the world. But of course, what, what are you doing, Pastor Che? Now I'm comparing our church to other churches. And if other churches are more loving to KCPC, then it will threaten our status as being the most loving church in the world. And now I become envious of other churches that's more loving. See, envy is a sneaky thing, right? It's a sneaky little fella. Like we say in Georgia. And so envy is very, very, it's, it's all over the place, especially now. Aren't you happy? Aren't you thankful to God? And I'm being sarcastic again, that social media has absolutely no impact on envy. Okay? Isn't it great that social media helps you be more envy free? Okay? Never in the history of the world have more people been recording their triumphs. Posting on Facebook or Instagram or what's that called? Tic Tac Toe, okay? It seems like everybody has better jobs, better ideas for decorating during Christmas time, better vacations, better kids, better dining experiences. By the way, okay, just, just, just please, can you stop posting incredible foods in, in Facebook and Instagram? I, because I get jealous and I get hungry too, okay? Can you stop it? Okay, I'm just kidding. You can post whatever, okay? But I get jealous, okay, when you post. Pork, beef, steak, okay? On, especially for those who are from Atlanta and California. But the more time we spend on social media, don't we get less envious, right? You know, envy is such a miserable thing, and we do it to ourselves. And yet, envy is so subtle. It's been around forever, it's been in the Bible. It's so deep because it's the opposite of love, okay? Now, it's important. There's a, little, there's a pretty long caveat. Here, Paul is not giving us a list of commands. He's not actually saying, don't do this, do this. He's describing what love is and what isn't. He's not primarily giving us a checklist. This is actually more descriptive than prescriptive. Okay? He actually doesn't say you should be more patient, you should be more kind. In fact, nothing can destroy your confidence more than if you put your name in front of this. Che is patient, 
Che is kind. Because what will happen? You realize you're not, and you get really down on yourself. Okay? So don't put your name before is. Remember back in 1998, President Clinton? He said, remember, someone questioned him about the Monica Lewinsky trial, uh, you know, scandal? And remember, he said, what is, is? I don't know. Okay, remember in 1996, the Olympic Games, the Lionel Olympic Games, the mascot for the Olympic Games was, what is it? I don't know, after 25 years, I'm still trying to figure that out. Okay, so don't put your name in front of this. That will be destructive for you, actually. He's not giving us a behavior checklist. He's not saying, now class, let's do this and this and this, and you'll get an A, B, C, or D. Now, most of you guys get graded, right? A, B, C, D, or an F, unless you go to Learner's School of Medicine, right? You, only, you pass if you don't kill the person, right? So he's not saying, let's try a little harder in class. Let's try, you know, he's not saying, a little bit of love in your life will make the world a better place. He's not saying that. The Bible is not sentimental. It's very, very straightforward, very realistic. He's just, he is confronting us with love. He says, before you can do love, you have to encounter love. You have to embrace love. You have to have a relationship with love. Who is love? It starts with a G, not Ganu. Who starts with, who is love? God, okay? Okay, God, okay? And only then will you become actual loving. You can't just do it mechanically. You know, people usually read this passage and they get very discouraged. Oh, I, can't, I want to be patient, I'm going to be patient. What happens when you really try to be patient? God, I want to be patient, I want to be patient, I want to be, I want to be more patient. I want to be, why, why am I not being patient? That's not the way to do it. It's not mechanical. It's more descriptive than prescriptive. There are some prescriptive elements, but it's more descriptive. What he does is he wants you to be naturally the kind of person your heart is prepared to do. You know, these godly actions are the result of a, a dwelling in love, the personal love, Jesus Christ, okay? Have you noticed, you know, when you're in love, okay, or when you think you're in love, what happens? It's naturally very easy to be patient with that girl, isn't it? Okay, okay, honey, you broke the side mirror of our car when you put out of the garage. That's okay. Okay, I love you. I'm very patient because I love you. Oh, honey, while you're driving, okay, while I was out of town in Atlanta, my car now has a flat tire. That's okay. I'm patient. I'm loving. By the way, those two things happened when I was in Atlanta, okay? Okay? Why are you okay with everything? It's because you're in love, because you're deeply dwelling in love. You get my point? When you're permeated with the one you love, then this list is easy. You can't, listen, you cannot get rid of envy by trying really hard to be not envious. I'm not going to be envious. I'm not going to be envious. You're not. It's like patience. There's, that is never the way of spiritual transformation. Envy can only get be, be written off if it's replaced with the overwhelming, overwhelming power of love. When love is present, there's no room for envy. So spiritual transformation is not envy management. It's not through gritted teeth repressing your feelings and stifling feelings. So I, I'm miserable inside, but outside it seems like I'm not envious. But when love is present, there's just no room for envy to take root. It has to take root in a human heart. It's not just you trying really hard, okay? Listen, there is some prescriptive elements too. The more and more you dwell with in, in Christ, the more you spontaneously look to Him for information and spontaneously look to Him for love, then this list becomes easier and easier. Let me give you an example. One of my friends, I mean, I'm sorry, one of my students, former student, he's in his 40s now, his name is Rich Park. He went, he went to the University of Illinois. He struggled with road rage. You know what he did? When people gave him that certain finger thing, okay, not this, not this, but you know what I'm saying? When he's driving, he said he got to the habit of naturally blessing them, even though his feelings didn't initially go there. He, he would say, God bless you. He naturally, spontaneously prayed for them. And he said, eventually, his feelings caught up. See, he was indwelling in God. He was doing opposite of what, what his instincts told him to do. And he grew in the area of not having so much road rage. You know, when Jesus hung on the cross and they spat at him and beat him, the hard thing for Jesus was to do was to spit back, right? To curse back. Why? He generally did what his heart told him to do. Isn't that the same with us? Don't we generally do what our heart is prepared to do? Here's the fallacy of the Pharisees. What did they do? They were so intent on aiming, that their aim was at keeping the law, keeping the law. But what, then rather than be kind of, kind of person who naturally became loving. You see, you can't just keep the law. 
You have to be indwelt in the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ, and then eventually, eventually you become a more natural person. You know, some of you guys are like, Pastor Che, I don't struggle with envy. I'm with my friends and family all the time. You know, I think there's two circles of people, relationships that we have. One might be called the circle of oneness, right? These are our family and friends, okay? These are people that, that we love. These are family or close friends who you I, admire, identify with. In some ways, you're one with them, okay? When they rejoice, you rejoice. When they hurt, you hurt. I never, ever envy my daughter, okay? Uh, you know, maybe one day, I'm not saying I will ever pray this, one day my, my son, Josiah, I don't know if he's going to be a doctor or a pastor, but let's say he becomes a pastor, Pastor Josiah, PJ, okay? You think as, as his father, I'd be like, yeah, I just mess up. I don't want him to be good as me. Oh, I'm envious. He's so much more talented than his daddy. Uh, he got his mama's genes, so smart, okay? Why is he picking? No, I'd be the worst dad in the world, okay? You know, one of my great joys is to see people like a mentor, like, like Lydia. I told her before, I want you, you know, one day I want you to you know, go to Kauai for three months and realize how terrible it is there and come back and be the senior pastor here. Okay, I want you to, I want you to be way above me. You see what I did? A humble brag. I'm bragging about myself, right? It's such insidious, right? But we call them the circle of oneness. We want them, it's easy not to be envious of your daughter and son. But there's another circle, right? We call them the circle of rivals. Boo. Okay? With them, it's the opposite. If they do well, you feel diminished. Okay? If they have problems, you kind of feel a little better about yourself. Okay? And what does Jesus say? He says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. Is there male or female? For you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's that simple. If you continue to look at people in your life as rivals, okay, you and God are in the opposite direction. Continue to practice a spiritual discipline of dwelling with God and pray for them. Okay, do the opposite of what your instincts tell you. Okay, pray for your enemy. Listen, C.S. Lewis says you most resemble God, okay, when you love your enemy. When you feel inferior or jealous of them, okay, pray for them. You know, a lot of times you can't control your feelings, but the great thing about prayer is that you can control praying for someone, right? You can, you can control your prayer. Pray for your competitor. So that hatred, that poison in you will slowly, little by little, dissipate. That's the plan. That's the that's community that Jesus called us to be. You know, um, some of, some of you, other people are like, I don't, you know, Pastor Che, actually, I don't struggle with envy at all. Okay, thanks for being humble, okay? But I don't struggle with envy at all, okay? But then, you know what? Humble, uh, envious people, they, you know, proud people, they, they do affect me. I said this to someone yesterday. Envious people, you know, John 10, 10 says this. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief is who? Starts with the S, not Stephen. S Satan. Starts with the L, not Lucy. Yeah, Lucifer, right? right? And so, but Satan, who's the most resentful being in the universe? Satan. Who's the most prideful being in the universe? Satan. Who's the most boastful being in the universe? Satan. Okay? Who never trusts? Who never hopes? Who never is patient? Satan, right? Okay? Satan, when we are envious, this is, and that's why it says earlier in, in, in James 3, when you are envious... At a deep level, I, I hate to be very harsh, it's demonic, actually. It actually says that. Don't, don't yell at me. That's what James 3 says. Because you are taking the form of a thief. An envious person is a thief. They try to take away your life. Jesus says in 1010, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So why do you allow a thief to continually steal your joy, steal your love in your life? Get a better security system. Get an ADT or a CHE or a GOD, right? Why do you continue to have them rob you? Okay, what is that great life, the Zoe life that Christ talks about in John 10.10? 10? It's a life full of love. So someone who is envious of you, who doesn't like you, who considers you as a rival, even though you yourself don't struggle in jealousy or envy, don't let them rob them of your joy. Have a better security system, Okay. It's called indwell indwelling with God. Well, I want to end with a word about the cross and envy. You know, on a human level, actually, envy is why 
there's a cross in the first place. We're told that Pilate knew that the chief priests and religious leader like me envied Christ, and that's why they wanted to kill him. Remember, Jesus Christ was a charismatic, powerful leader, leader, and they wanted to kill him because of their envy, okay? So in their envy, they planned to kill him. And what does Jesus say in so many words? I will be the object of their envy, of the worst that envy can do. I will put myself so they can be envious of me to take away the envy towards each other. And when your envy is spent, when your hatred is spent, I will still love you. I will still ask God to forgive you, okay? And at the cross, God defeated every envy, okay? And you notice he did not protect himself. He did not avenge himself. He did the absolute opposite. That was his whole life. He died because of envy, because of hatred, because of the opposite of love. And then one day that tomb was empty and he was resurrected and love triumphed, amen? And so now God calls his community that no longer do you have a circle of rivals, but the circle of oneness, the circle of life, right? And so we don't have to be puffed up by your arrogance, by your envy and your pridefulness because we're loved. And to the degree that you know that you really know how loved you are in Christ is the degree that you will no longer have envy take over your life. Listen, you know, we live, our church is extremely educated. I'm not being sarcastic now, okay? You guys are extremely educated. You guys are extremely smart. You guys are extremely beautiful. Okay, even the guys. You guys are extremely, you have so many gifts. You have enough gifts to, to literally transform the city of Cleveland. You also have enough gifts to destroy the city of Cleveland. Okay? And I'm, I'm calling you. Do not, do not let the devil take away your joy. Do not let the devil steal your joy, steal your love. Ray, rise above that. Amen? And, and dwell in the Holy Spirit and dwell in God and dwell in Christ, who is love. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this, this challenging, challenging passage. But we know this is the most loving passage on love in the history of literature, in the history of humankind. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son. Lord, I thank you so much for your great love. And when we were envious, you still loved us. When we were in deep in sin, you continually loved us. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you take away the spirit of envy from our hearts, that we will truly, truly root each other on, that we will be each other's greatest cheerleader. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, if we could all stand up as we worship together. Be my anthem, Lord, when the world has fallen quiet, you stand beside me, give me a song in the night, and Jesus, I need you every Praise for 
Let's sing that again, Jesus. And Jesus, I need you every moment. I need you here now. This grace our hearts sing and you praise forever. Remember love. Remember love. Remember mercy. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Your loving kindness has never failed me. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Remember love. Remember mercy, Christ before me, Christ behind me, your loving kindness has never failed me, Christ before me, Christ remember love, remember love, remember mercy, Christ before me. Behind me, your loving kindness has never failed me. Christ before me, Christ behind me. And Jesus, I need you every moment. I need you here now. This great. Bless you and keep you. May his light shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may his face turn you towards you and grant you shalom. We thank you for your overwhelming love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. I can meet with all the college leaders. That'd be great. Thank you, Shane.